um, partner to the town in terms of um, their contribution to the community, their history within the community, etc. Um, what we've seen and experienced over the last few years, particularly when the economy went south and our town budget was overly taxed, was that um, the costs of providing the hospital services, because they're such a large organization, particularly in the public safety realm, um, it became um, a very costly enterprise for the town to the detriment of taxpayers here and residents here because um, we were you know, on occasion in a situation where um, we were forced to close a station and um, if we had to send services to the hospital that would leave one station of three to service the entire rest of our community. Um, so that brought us to um, some discussion points um, and we um, have enlisted the services of your colleagues um, and certainly welcome yours and your participation but really what we're trying to do is find some creative ways to offset some or, or mitigate some of those expenses and we don't really have an answer or a proposal mm -hmm. um, but what we do know is that um, there there must be a way for us to access some offsetting funds or you know you just mentioned cemetery transfer of land at a value all of that ties into the Commonwealth in some way there must be a way that's a very unique set of circumstances for a community such as this that has a, a large state property or state organization that is impacting um, the service delivery and ultimately of course the local residents um, are paying for those public safety services and if they're not able to tap into them when they need them it becomes somewhat concerning so so um, I would ask your assistance in quantifying for me what that yep. looks like yep um, we have that data we, we can to. we can um, Yep. You know, sit down and figure out a way in which we could it's, do um, this. It's a year-over-year -year issue, and it's something that um, I have to say we got um, refreshing a welcome um, response from the state hospital, and both Representative Maselli and Lyons have indicated that they're willing to help us try to work with this, so I, I um, will get you the information, and okay. hopefully um, we can talk further about that as we go. Great. So just to put some context behind what Tewksbury State Hospital is dealing with right now yes, is the $2.2 million yeah. reduction in the governor's proposed budget, mm -hmm. which will, um, you know, end up putting a number of folks out of work, consolidating, a, um, you know, one of the floors over there. And uh, I don't think that's the way we should be approaching nope. this at all. In fact, just a little history in, in the previous administration, they were trying to close down that Taunton State Hospital, mm -hmm. and the legislators sort of fought that back every year. So I think the new governor looked at it and said, "Well, Taunton's got, you know, got a lot of people fighting to keep it open. So let's look somewhere else." And they must have looked at yeah. Tewksbury. So um, I think that you know that will be one of my highest priorities sure. is trying to maintain that level of service for for Tewksbury. Uh, state hospitals. So I think that what we need to do is work with um, the administrator over there. I had a lovely meeting with her as well when I was first elected and Scott was there. Um, but I think that we need to do uh, both things. So we need to Agreed. fight to keep the 2.2 million and at the same time work with her in a way that doesn't further impact her budget. We so agree. I'm not, I would not look to take anything out of her operating budget. No, we agree on that look point. at something yep. similar to pilot to figure out if there's a way of recognizing this. And there may very well be other communities that have creatively done this, but it's so obliquely worded that you can't necessarily find it. So I and need to do a little bit of data. That's the but creative I need your, thinking we're looking I need your for. dollar yep. amount though, okay? Because yep. I need to know what the ballpark asks is We'll get you here. something on that. Great. Yep. And, and quite frankly, I do it while dollars are preferable. Uh -huh. um, it can be, I think, I speak safely to say that, you know, trade-offs or some other way of, of recognizing that added expense is something that at least is moving in the right direction. Right. So there's, there's ways to be creative here. Mm -hmm. And um, I would know, just for clarity's sake, this issue has been something that's been on our radar for a number of years, so it predates the current budget turmoil that you just right. mentioned. So and maybe offline it would be helpful yeah. to me to get the history of what's been attempted yeah. in the past and by who and what yeah. result and it's just helpful for me to get the background. So we'll regroup with you on that. Great. Um, 
All right, so um, the next item is, um, as you probably are aware, we here in Tewksbury um, undertook a very aggressive um, infrastructure project to improve uh, water and sewer systems. Mm -hmm. After uh, we meet with you tonight, we're gonna have another presentation about a dramatic improvement in our water treatment facility mm -hmm. um, that's on the table. Um, but that put us in a uh, difficult situation as a community because of the you know cost of paying for that. Um, so we're interested in at least exploring with you potential for um, any kind of cost mitigation or benefits to people like our seniors, veterans, um, and the community in general as it relates to uh, specifically sewer and water um, usage fees. Um, the state had a program that um, was funded, um, I forget the amount, but it was, you know, for, so it, so it, yeah, mm -hmm. a couple of million dollars statewide. Right. Um, you know, this is a hundred million dollar project <laughs> that Tuxbury took on. Mm -hmm. So um, we're trying to come up with some options or some avenues to consider um, that would involve um, uh, you and your colleagues at a state level mm -hmm. uh, that might help us to mitigate that. Um, we've done as much as we can locally to refinance when um, it was advantageous. Mm -hmm. We've done everything to address rates as best we can. Um, but the reality is, um, you know, it's still an expense that has to be borne. And people who, you know, for example, seniors on a fixed income, it's, it's sometimes a very difficult thing for them to deal with. So we're trying to come up with some creative approaches there. No answers expected tonight, but... We did file a bill that mirrors what Rep. Maselli did. Awesome. So I sent copies over at Senate Docket 1568. So Great. And that would, uh, I guess, reestablish the $2 million for the sewer rate relief fund. And Super. out of that, I had to earmark two hundred thousand for Tuck's Ferry. Excellent. It's a good start. Yeah. So we sometimes we that. just have to instead of feeling overwhelmed by the totality of something, you just have to just mm -hmm. try to dig away at it. You know, take chip pieces away, at it. Yeah. Chip away. Yeah. Very good. I'm using time. the wrong word. <laughs> chip away. Um, I mean, that's that's how you do it, right? I, I will just mention parenthetically, I have another community I represent who wants $72 million for an all-in project mm. and can't break down any incremental cost for me. And it's not gonna happen yeah. because they're not being realistic. Yeah. So I'm a big realist and, mm. and I will uh, do my I, utmost to break this down into meaningful chunks for you. Well, okay. and that's the approach that we've taken through some very difficult times. And uh, if history is a guide, it's proven that it works for us here because we're sort of uh, in a better place than we were five or six years ago. So um, that brings us to the last item that we really wanted to touch base with you on tonight. And that deals with our public library. Right. Um, and the library itself is um, a, a jewel in our community. Um, when the economy tanked a few years back, um, we were forced to make radical cuts to every budget in our town budget, general fund, including our uh, library. And um, what that leads to is a discussion specifically about the uh, subscriptions and periodicals budget. And um, because the maintenance of effort wasn't maintained, um, the library continuously year over year now finds itself in the uh, unfortunate situation of requesting waivers from the Board of Library Commissioners um, because we can't climb out of the hole. And as I understand the facts, in order to get out of that predicament, um, Tewksbury would have to infuse roughly $200,000 to make up for the years that we have been um, below the maintenance of effort requirement. Quite frankly, with the budget situation the way it is and other more pressing priorities, that's an unrealistic ask mm -hmm. from our vantage point. Right. And while we um, invest every year more than we do the year before in our library, we can't catch up and make up for the poor economy of five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so to us, it's an inequitable situation that we can't fix. Mm -hmm. We don't have the funds to, at our disposal to, to correct that. Mm -hmm. So what we're really looking for is your assistance and that of your colleagues. What we'd like to do is 
essentially have a requeuing from, let's say, tonight forward, mm -hmm. where the level of funding that the town has put towards its library is the baseline and hold us to the standards moving forward. But don't penalize us for the fact that the economy went south. The town had to keep its teachers employed, and its public safety right. working. Right. Everyone was cetera. making tough decisions. Agreed. There's no doubt about it. So, just a couple of questions because I actually read um, Chelsea Feinstein's article from a couple of weeks ago. She's here tonight. Um, so, just so I'm fully clear, you you're in the whole two hundred thousand. How much is it on a yearly basis? And I do read that you you are able to meet your eighty percent compliance. But what's the amount mm -hmm. that goes into the budget? yearly for this to meet your compliance well the library itself to, to get to compliance annually no annually not the 200 oh. that you're what's the amount each year that you're you're doing it says you're at compliance you're doing 80 percent right um, so. i'm just curious it's compliance it's also hours open okay that factor into it right, right. Um, so that's tougher because and while he's looking for the library budget is yeah. uh, one million twenty one thousand eight hundred sixty Okay, yeah. so 1.2. Yeah. Okay, so I believe that the, the town of Saugus had a similar situation um, back in, you know, six, seven years ago. There was a representative named Mark Felzone, and he put a lot of work into this. Um, he no longer represents Saugus, but I'm going to go back and do some homework and figure out what exactly he did. Mm -hmm. But it seems at a bare minimum, we need to convene a meeting with the Board of Library Commissioners and just sort of, um, you know, plead the case to go prospectively at this point. And then you're not gonna play catch up, you're not in a position to do that. Um, I actually worked with them pretty closely when I used to represent Oxford because they'd received a library sure. grant and there were a lot of fits and starts with that Correct. particular project. So, um, so my suggestion would be that we get together with the Board of Library Commissioners. I don't know if that's already happened in the past, but that... No, I believe our library director has had numerous communications with them. So um, we need to step it up. And, like. and we need to loop her in on this, yeah. but um, I, I view this as a state issue because I know Tewksbury is not unique in this situation. Right. We can attack it at a micro level, but it, in my view, it's a macro level right. issue. And that's what this yeah. gentleman was doing. Mark yeah. Felzon was the yeah. chair of the library. He started a library caucus yeah. because his town was about to lose their library right. altogether. I'm familiar um, with that and issue so, the storyline. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. It, you know, it, it may be that we right. need to get involved and we need to sort of up the pressure and all of that. So well, to give you an example, we're in our proposed budget for next year we have the addition of a teen librarian mm -hmm. um, i'm making numbers up but i'm going to say it's forty-five thousand, forty-two thousand dollars. 42 thousand dollars mm -hmm. that doesn't count towards this equation but it's a forty-two thousand dollar additional expenditure that the town is willing to potentially put forward to improve our library service but it doesn't count towards the books and periodical issue which drives the two hundred thousand dollar problem Right. So, the messaging, if you will, if you're thinking from 30,000 feet, is backwards. Mm -hmm. you, you, we, I would think the library commissioners would want the town of Tewksbury to invest in additional personnel to serve the public who utilize our library to the extent they do. Mm -hmm. And yet, there's no credit for that. They're forcing us to make choices that really don't square. Mm -hmm. So. Again, welcome also, the conversation. I mean, analogous to conversations we were having when I was on the school committee around purchasing textbooks versus at what point is a lot of this going to go online. So, you know, it may be that they need to rethink that as well because a lot of what may be needed instead of purchasing particular books might be licenses to be able to yep. utilize them and download them. Some tweaking well. needs to be at least considered to, to right. help us out. I'm happy so, to get involved in this. It's awesome. Uh, you know, awesome. and again, sometimes I, I feel like sometimes the library directors might be out there trying to do what they need to do, but sometimes it just takes bringing it up the ladder and having some other folks have her back um, to yep. see where we can take this. So well, that's why we, we wanted to, to speak with you about it. We appreciate sure. your uh, willingness to meet with us. I, I may have mentioned this to you today when we spoke by phone um, anticipating this discussion, but um, we view this as the start of a dialogue. Obviously, your comments tonight um, um, reflect the same 
uh, context that um, we're not going to make decisions or come to a resolution on any of these things this evening, but um, we welcome your further input, your stewardship of all of these issues for us. These right now are the priorities that we've had um, collectively, and uh, we'd encourage you to kind of keep those in mind as, as you um, look out for Tuxbury and our needs. I know there are other pressing issues right. as so well. So before but. 2 o'clock tomorrow, mm -hmm. I'd love to have a dollar amount, a ballpark on the um, yeah. Tuxbury State Hospital uh, back yeah. and forth, because we I'm have, meeting we have literally at 2 o'clock with the uh, Senate Chair of Ways and Means. Can we make okay. sure that happens, Mr. Montori? Just so I have a ball. Yeah. And I would agree. Um, I think you will find, um, you know, I'm, I'm new to all of you, um, but when I was a legislator, I would come in uh, every couple of months and update the boards if they wanted that, because so much of this, there's so many variables right now, and some of those will become more set yep. and concrete as time goes forward. Certainly, um, when the House budget comes out, uh, when, their, when their amendment process concludes, when our budget comes out, when our amendment process concludes, in terms of budgetary, um, in terms of uh, legislation, as I said, committees are really slow to get up and running this year. Um, but once that starts, and once I'm able to get the handoff on the legislation that we have a placeholder for you, um, but uh, you know, there's so many different variables that we'll know more about as time goes on. Mm -hmm. So I'm more than happy to come in on a regular basis and keep you updated. Um, that's what I did for the six communities that I represented in the past. So I will leave it to your discretion to decide how often you want me to come, or if something major makes a change, I will certainly contact you with that Terrific. information so that if that may be the decision maker to have myself or the whole delegation come back. And I just want to um, let you know that um, uh, we're working together as a delegation very well. Um, there's a little bit of a backstory in that, you know, mm -hmm. one of the two House members uh, had replaced me in the House. I tried to replace him back. Um, but there's no tension there. We mm -hmm. work together. We both represent um, two of the communities. And um, we work together quite well on a number of issues. So mm -hmm. um, if you feel that it's at some point um, advantageous to have the three of us here. Yeah. I think that that would be perfectly fine. There, I mean, no we doubt we we'll all need to work together right. because Agreed. if we don't, and we're off in three different directions, then we're not helping yeah. you at the end of the day. So that's why well, I asked each of the legislators, what did you put in for your requests for Tewksbury? I want to see them, I want to be in sync. So that, as you know from budget process, in an ideal world, if something's in both the House and the Senate, there's no conference, it goes forward in the final package. So. The common theme that we've taken away from these three separate discussions is that um, the three of you are um, in lockstep relative to these issues. So um, that is a very positive message. And um, there's no question we'll take advantage of your offer to come back and see us. Mm -hmm. And as the need arises, um, at some point, we would certainly have all three of you uh, concurrently to, to talk through whatever issues. So we appreciate it. We wanted to afford each of you the opportunity to individually at the I outset here. But, yes. um, so I want to thank you for um, spending time on behalf of my colleagues with us. Um, as things progress, um, certainly know you have an open line to any of us and, and the town manager. Um, and we look forward to talking with you again, hopefully very Thank soon. Thank you so much. And I just want right. to wish Scott well as he mm -hmm. cycles off the board <laughs> and yes. recognize his many years of dedicated service to Tuxbury. So Thank you, good luck. And you'll uh, be glad to have a little time back with your family, I'm sure. Absolutely. And uh, as I told these guys, I'll be around. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Thank, Thank you so much. much. All right, Mr. Montori. Um, do you is this next? Uh, is there a PowerPoint? I guess that's possible. So we need to we need two minutes to set that up. No, yet. Yeah. Okay. That makes it easy. All right, so we're going to uh, invite our guests from AECOM to uh, talk with us about the water treatment plant and proposed um, improvements to that facility. I don't know right. if yeah, well, they're setting yeah, that up if you want to uh, offer any introduction. There's a warrant article uh, on the annual town meeting warrant this year. Uh, it's been in the making for the last couple of years for the upgrades uh, to the uh, water treatment plant in town. Uh, the warrant article seeks to borrow $13.1 million. 
undertake the upgrades. AE Com was hired by the town uh, a couple years ago to undertake a feasibility study and then undertake the design of the treatment plan. Feasibility study was funded uh, through a town meeting a couple years ago. We came back to town meeting to seek funding for design. That was also approved. This is a project that has you know, been in front of town meeting discussions leading up to this thirteen point one million dollars. So this is not something that we dropping on the news line tonight. Um, the water rates that I presented a few weeks ago incorporate the thirteen point one million dollars into them. Um, I've asked them um, to come tonight to make a presentation to the board uh, to present uh, their findings and the uh, projected costs for the plan. Um, before we do that, um, Brian, there are several key players in the vote tonight. In addition to the eight calls previously, I really don't want to introduce. If I haven't introduced themselves to the board, um, and yet, yeah, participation. So, Lou and Peter, why don't you guys come up front to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Peter Hartford. Um, I run my own company, MPH Environmental. I'm the resident of town Andover, and about a little less than three miles away from the water plant. I've been hired as the owner project manager. Um, I've been working with Billy as well as eight times for you know, the last eight months or so. Um, before I became an owner's project manager, I had worked for my family for 15 years and also for a camp customer for um, well, almost two years. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Lou? I'm Lou Zivian. I'm the chief operator uh, of the uh, water treatment plant. Welcome and again. Nice yeah. to see you. Yes. It's been a while. It's been a while. And I know we have Brian, our uh, DPW director, with us tonight. Yes, good evening. Uh, How are you? Mr. Chairman. Good. Um, I'm going to turn it over quickly to uh, Don and Steve from AECOM. But I just want to say that, and just to reiterate that um, this project started, uh, well, really it has its roots in uh, 2009, 2010, when we received a uh, notice of non-compliance. At that time, we took a very close look at our treatment process and a plant that was 27 years old. Mm -hmm. In light of the fact that uh, we do have a changing water that comes down the river, environmental factors, but uh, uh, I guess one very important fact is that DEP and, uh, was looking at changing their regulations. And we wanted to make sure that we were going to meet those regulations given the fact that we just received those of our compliance. So we, do, uh, we dove in, uh, we did an assessment of the plant. Um, um, uh, again, a plant that's 27 years old, and we started a planning process that brings us to tonight, in which um, um, these two gentlemen will present to you. Excellent. So before we get started, please um, yes. give us your name so we can Good talk you. with you intelligently. Good evening. My name is Don Shelton. Thanks. I serve as a Commons Project Director for our work here in Tuxbury. Awesome. And to my immediate right is Steve Francesco, who uh, serves as the project manager for our work. Terrific. Thank you. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us here this evening. This is an important project for the town. No question. Uh, as the previous speakers have, have mentioned, the project has been ongoing for a few years now between the assessment and the design, and we, and we wanted to take this opportunity to update you on the project as well as the cost associated with it. Yes. So we've been prepared an agenda of items that we'd like to cover. Uh, we're gonna start off with a little background information on the plant so, so you have an understanding of what the facility is about. Uh, we'll talk about some typical drives. What, what, what usually drives a community to in upgrade a facility like their water treatment plant? Uh, I'm going to go over some of the major improvements that are proposed for the program, and I'm going to conclude with our opinion of cost for the work. The water treatment plant is located in the northeast corner of Tuxbury. Its uh, source water is the, is the uh, Merrimack River. It's located in a somewhat of a precarious location in that it's about two miles downstream of the confluence with the Concord River, and it's also about a little less than that downstream of the lower wastewater treatment plant. Now the river itself, the water quality in the river is typical of a river that passes through populated areas and agricultural areas. But what makes the, the, uh, 
in the Merrimack River water challenging is that it's, a, it's called a flashy water. And by that, we mean that it can change water quality significantly over a very short period of time. Uh, one of the measurements of, of water quality is, is turbidity, and it's measured in NTU units. Uh, and, it, and it measures the, the, the clarity of the water. Lou and his team have taken measurements over time that have, that have been less than 10 NTUs and at other times over 1,500 NTUs. So that's quite, a, that's a very wide range of water quality. And when you have those kinds of challenges, coupled with being just downstream of a wastewater treatment plant, it really takes a skill set of operators to be able to deal with the fluctuations. And you're very fortunate that the team you have led by uh, Lou Bluesy from City Island. Taking a closer look at the facilities themselves, uh, the plant is located on Merrimack Drive. There are two major facilities. The uh, smaller of the facilities is the raw water pump station. That, the pump station draws water from the river. There is some preliminary chemical treatment that occurs at that, at that facility, and then that, the water is pumped from there up to the treatment plant where the actual treatment occurs. Uh, there are improvements are proposed or planned for both facilities. If you're familiar at all with the Trollbrook Golf Course, that green on the, on the left is the 13th hole. I think I've been in that trap more times than I can get a talk. I think I've hit the plant. <laughs> <laughs> the plant itself was constructed in 1988, and at that time it was constructed with a capacity of 3.5 MGD. <clears throat> In 2000, the plant went through a major expansion and the capacity was increased to 7 uh, MGD. MGD is million gallons per day. In 2005, a sludge dewatering system was added. Now, when, when you treat the water, one of the steps in the treatment process is to add some chemicals, slow the water down a little bit, and allow the solid matter to drop out. That solid matter is called sludge. So almost in every treatment plant, you really have two process trains. You've got a liquid train that treats the water that ultimately goes to your users. And then you have the byproduct of the process, which is called sludge, which also has to be treated. So in 2005, the plant installed some sludge dewatering equipment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. The plant's considered, the process is considered a conventional process. It has rapid mix, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, and then it is, and then it is disinfected prior to being introduced into the distribution system. The plant has never been resurfaced, so it's a 27-year-old facility. Even if you were to start this year with the construction of new facilities, it's probably going to be three years before everything is up and running. So by that time, the equipment will have been 30 years old or maybe old. So what are the typical drives? What, what makes a community want to or need to upgrade their treatment plant? One of them is capacity. Uh, the treatment plant just can't deliver the amount of water a community needs. Now, in your particular case, as I mentioned earlier, the plant has a, has a capacity of 7 million gallons a day. That's considered the ultimate capacity. That means that everything is running full bore and you can get 7 million gallons from the plant. But when you rate a plant, you really rate it on what's called its front capacity. You have to have some redundancy in the units. In the event that a prime time, major demand time, something happens to one of your units, you get a backup system to immediately take over so you don't lose capacity. When you look at the, when you look at the firm capacity of, the, of your plant, it's 6.2 MGD. When we did a, uh, an evaluation of the plant in 2012, we looked at the future demands, water demands. And our projection was based on a 20-year projection. When we, when we ran that analysis, we estimated that, that the future average day demand would be two and a half energy, two and a half million gallons per day. But the key number is what's the max day demand. That day in August when it's 95 degrees and sprinkler systems are running and people are using their pools and all that, and all that, those kinds of things. And the max day demand out in the future, based on our projections, was 5.3 million gallons per day. So you're really in good shape. You know, 5.3 demand, 6.2 capacity, seven ultimate capacity if you had to go there. So capacity is not a, not a driver for it. The second driver is process enhancements. And there's two, two, two things that, 
that uh, are related to process enhancements. The first is if there's new regulations. Sometimes the EPA or other agencies will promulgate some new regulations that require you to add some processes to be able to treat whatever it is that they want you to treat for. A second item is, is to improve your existing treatment process. Over time, you learn things that work and things that can work better. You look at things that can, that can save you money and improve your overall treatment process. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that, that's another item that's, that's used to enhance your treatment, uh, consideration to enhance your treatment process. You, as part of this program, there are some project process enhancements, and I'm going to talk about those in a, in a minute. The last item is just is equipment and facility improvements. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the plants in 1980.